In this session of Pharmacology World, we're going to explore the world of pharmacodynamics. What is pharmacodynamics? Well, as you can see from the quote at the bottom, pharmacodynamics describes the actions of drugs in the body. In other words, pharmacodynamics tells us what drugs do to the cells, receptors, and other molecular targets in our bodies that allow drugs to exert their gross physiologic effects. It is a heavily molecular science that relies on biochemistry, molecular, and cellular biology. And so as a result, I'm going to integrate brief summaries of these disciplines into our discussions during this session. Receptors are really at the heart of pharmacology. A receptor is a specific component of a cell that's usually a protein that upon binding a ligand conveys a signal to the interior of the cell leading to alterations in cellular biochemistry and physiology. There are literally tens of thousands of a given receptor on the surface of a cell. What this should tell us right away is that there is a threshold of receptor binding that needs to be reached for a cell to change its behavior in response to the binding of a ligand or a drug. The major subtypes of receptors are listed here. They include ligand-gated ion channels, which are also known as ionotropic receptors, G-protein coupled receptors, also known as metabotropic receptors, kinase-linked receptors or enzyme-linked receptors, and nuclear hormone receptors. So the first type of receptor I want to focus on are the ligand-gated ion channels. Ligand-gated ion channels are generally composed of more than one subunit. And these channels can open or close in response to the binding of a ligand. Once open, ions can freely flow into the cell. This leads to one of two events, hyperpolarization, or depolarization. These events in turn lead to changes in cellular behavior. The time scale for these events are on the order of milliseconds. One example of a ligand-gated ion channel is the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. and the ligand in this case would be acetylcholine. The next type of receptor I want to look at are G-protein coupled receptors. And again, if we draw a picture of a cell and we draw a receptor at the center, binding of a ligand to this receptor triggers activation of a signaling cascade that's mediated by G-proteins. So the G-protein relays this signal to an enzyme like adenylyl cyclase, for example. Now we'll discuss this type of enzyme later, but basically this enzyme can help generate what are called second messengers. These second messengers can then cause several events to occur. They can cause calcium release, They can cause protein phosphorylation. And these events can lead to cellular changes. G-protein coupled receptors can also directly activate and alter ion channels. So these are two different ways that G-protein coupled receptors can alter the activity of a cell. G-protein coupled receptors act on the order of seconds. One example of a G-protein coupled receptor is a muscarinic cholinergic receptor. 
and the ligand in this case would be acetylcholine. The same ligand we saw a moment ago for the ligand gated ion channels. But in this case, the ligand is the same, but it's bonding to a different type of receptor. The next type of receptor I want to look at are the kinase linked receptors, also known as enzyme linked receptors. So if we draw a picture of a cell, we can place the receptor here in the middle again. Upon binding the ligand, this receptor is able to phosphorylate targets inside the cell, initiating cell signaling events. These can ultimately cause changes in transcription and translation. which lead to changes in cellular behavior and cellular effects. Kinase linked receptors work over the course of hours. So the time scale is a little bit longer than what we've seen so far for the other receptor types. And the reason that these receptors take so long to work is that we're actually getting changes in transcription and protein synthesis. And so these processes take a long time to initiate and execute. One example of a kinase linked receptor is epidermal growth factor binding to the epidermal growth factor receptor. Finally, we get to the last subtype of receptor that I want to look at, and that's the nuclear receptors, also known as the nuclear hormone receptors. In this case, the receptor is actually located inside of the cell, and the ligand is able to freely diffuse through the cell membrane and bind to that receptor. What are we talking about? A steroid, for example, that can permeate the cell membrane and make its way into the cell to bind a nuclear hormone receptor. This receptor ligand complex can then go to the nucleus and cause changes in transcription and this can lead to cellular changes. Again, because we're talking about changes in transcription, hours. Hours for these signaling events to occur, from the moment that ligand makes its way into the cell to the moment that we get a cellular change. Estrogen and the estrogen receptor. Are examples of nuclear hormone receptors. So the reason I've spent time looking at these different receptor types and the ligands that bind them is not because I want to discuss molecular biology or talk about these signaling cascades in more depth, but I want to try to convince you that drugs act in a manner that's very similar to ligands, and in many cases the drugs actually mimic the activity of the ligands. Or they can bind to a similar site that the ligands bind, but they block the actions of that receptor. So the example that I want to give you is that of sumatriptan. Sumatriptan is a selective agonist for the serotonin receptor, and it's used to abort migraines. I'd like you to compare it to the structure of the endogenous neurotransmitter serotonin. You can see that it looks very, very similar, with some slight modifications. We can infer from the similarity of the drug and the ligand that they bind to similar sites on the serotonin receptor. So in this way, the drug is acting in a manner similar to the endogenous ligand. The receptor-ligand interaction is driven by the interaction of a drug with the receptor at the binding site. The affinity for which the drug binds to the receptor is determined by several factors including the three-dimensional structure of the drug, the shape of the receptor, and the reactivity of both the drug and the receptor, as well as chemical interactions between the drug and the receptor binding site. Affinity can really be thought of as the probability of a drug occupying a receptor at any given moment. So what are the type of chemical interactions that we would have that would describe the affinity of a drug for a receptor? Ionic bonds, Hydrogen bonds, van der Waals, and covalent interactions.
So the important point about these types of bonds is that they vary in their strength. And so this can help shape the type of affinity that a drug has for a receptor, and in turn the kind of effect that we'll get at that receptor. As I've already mentioned, the three-dimensional structure of the drug can also dictate how the drug interacts with the receptor, the degree of affinity that that drug has for that receptor, and the types of events that are going to occur from that interaction. Because drugs are complex organic molecules, they may exist as what are known as enantiomeric pairs. Since the receptor binding pocket requires multiple highly specific interactions, a receptor in many cases will discriminate against one enantiomer over another. Most drugs are currently marketed as what are known as racemic mixtures, that is, they contain both enantiomers, the D and the L isomer. An example of this is isoproterenol. Isoproterenol binds to beta adrenergic receptors, and this is a perfect example of how chirality can alter the interaction of a drug with a receptor. On the left-hand side, we have the D isomer, D isoproterenol, and on the right-hand side, we have the L isomer, or L isoproterenol. It turns out that because of this asymmetric carbon here, that this hydroxyl group is in a different three-dimensional orientation. But this makes a world of difference. D isoproterenol is a beta receptor antagonist. Whereas L isoproterenol is a beta receptor agonist. You can see that the change in the orientation of that hydroxyl group makes a huge difference with the way that this drug interacts with this receptor. In one case, it's an antagonist that will block the activity of that receptor, and in the other case, it's an agonist that will actually stimulate the receptor. Chirality also dictates the therapeutic indication of drugs, that is, their therapeutic use. Let's compare the structure of quinine to quinidine. These drugs are optical isomers. Both drugs are effective as antimalarial agents, and in some parts of the world, quinidine is actually superior. However, quinidine is considered to be a prototypical antiarrhythmic agent. So let's synthesize this information we've learned so far. Affinity leads to a selective drug receptor interaction, which in turn leads to a specific effect. An example that we can look at here is nortriptyline, which is a tricyclic antidepressant. It exerts its activity, its antidepressive actions, by blocking norepinephrine reuptake transporters on noradrenergic neurons in the central nervous system. This is a specific effect where the drug is interacting with high affinity with its target. Sometimes, however, the specific effect is an undesired one. Nortriptyline also causes significant cardiovascular effects at clinically relevant doses because it blocks alpha-1 adrenergic receptors on vascular smooth muscle. Sometimes the adverse effect of a drug is due to a drug acting on specific receptors with high affinity, but in tissues that are not related to the therapeutic indication. So to summarize what we've learned so far, the effect produced by administration of a drug is mediated by receptors. Importantly, the drug and the receptor form a drug receptor complex that is governed by several factors. Drug concentration, association and dissociation constants, and receptor conformation. Therefore, one of the most basic tenets of receptor theory is that increasing drug concentration or dose drives the reaction forward and leads to an increase in effect according to the law of mass action. The law of mass action states that particles tend to flow from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. This phenomena can be understood by considering an everyday example, diffusion of a smell across a room. If someone were to open up a bottle of perfume on one side of a room, the particles of perfume permeate the areas of the room that are devoid of perfume until an equilibrium is reached. In other words, the perfume goes from an area of high concentration to areas of low concentration. Ligands and drugs finding their way to and from receptors behave in the same manner, and they follow the law of mass action. And this helps explain in part why the reactions I just showed you are reversible. As ligand concentration at the receptor builds, the law of mass action begins to work in reverse, and the ligand dissociates from the receptor, and the receptor-driven effect is terminated. So it turns out that the relationship between ligand binding to a receptor or a drug binding to a receptor is more complicated than what I showed a moment ago.
Modern receptor theory has shown us that receptors can exist in an active conformation and an inactive conformation in the absence of bound ligand as a result of normal thermodynamic changes in receptor structure. What this means is that receptors have a low basal level of activity in the absence of bound ligand or drug. However, if a drug or ligand binds to a receptor in the active conformation, this produces a maximal effect, whereas drug bound to a receptor in the inactive conformation yields no effect. So let's draw out this relationship. A receptor can exist in an inactive conformation, and this toggles back and forth between an active conformation. This active conformation of the receptor, even in the absence of bound ligand or drug, has a weak level of activity. If ligand or drug binds to the inactive conformation of the receptor, there's no effect. However, if ligand or drug bind to the active conformation, there's a massive effect. We'll explore this relationship between the dose and the response more in part two of this session on pharmacodynamics.